Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of our series entitled To Consider and Praise. As always, I'm Pastor Zach McGowan. I'm really glad that you're taking this time to journey with us through the Psalms. You know, I get excited about a lot of things. I get excited when my kids have success. I get excited when my family and I have a chance to do something new. I get excited about discovery. I get excited when I accomplish a task. I get excited when I help people understand the scriptures. I get excited helping people in general and seeing that help matter beyond the moment. And when I get really excited about something, I celebrate. You know, the Psalms are full of such calls to celebration. And in the first third of the Psalm book, Psalm 33 is the epitome of such a call. Not only are the people of God prompted to worship and sing and even shout for the Lord, they are told specifically why they are to engage in that sort of celebration. So let's read Psalm 33 together. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all of his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people's the counsel of the Lord, it stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as a heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth, he who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all of their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. You know, as you look back over this psalm, take a moment and and just think about, you know, what are the things that you celebrate? When you look at creation, when you look at at what God has done out in the the creation that we get to, 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 to enjoy, when you see how God organizes your life and, and even the, the the histories of of the nations, does that cause you as much celebration as as one of your own accomplishments? Take some time, read back over Psalm 33, and reflect on what it means for your life. It seems kind of amazing, but Psalm 33 is one of the few explicit psalms of praise outside of book three of the psalmody. The author calls readers to praise God for all of his activities in creation and in the movements of the nations. The overall theme of this psalm is, is, is one of worship. Worship to the sovereign uh, movements and activities of our God because God has demonstrated his presence and he will continue to do so. By comparison, all those who claim authority in some way, shape, or form, anyone who claims to have power, 
they pale in comparison. They're nothing. Now, when people look at Psalm 33 in this kind of holistic way, they try, have tried to set this psalm in a specific worship context for the Hebrew people. Such attempts are just that. They're attempts. I think it's better for us to, to think of this as, as a, a psalm of, of general praise, where the people would have just been praising God for who He is. They, they would have looked at what God has done in his creative work, his historical work, and his continuing presence, and, and that would have been enough for them to get excited and celebrate. The structure of this psalm is a bit difficult to nail down. Uh, Galen see, sees a cyclical structure in this psalm, while Peter Craigie employs a structure whereby the called-for praise is directed at specific aspects of God's work or character. Both are fine places to start and great outlines, but I'm going to work with a more simplified structure that highlights what I believe are the two key verses of chapter 33. So we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 as a call to musical praise. And then the the theme verses of this psalm are Psalm 4 and 5, which gives the reader a motivation to praise God. Verses 6 through 17 expounds on that motivation. And then the psalm closes in verses 18 through 22 with with a call for the people to continue to hope in God. J. Clinton McCann points out that while this psalm is not an acrostic, there are 22 lines in this psalm, which is analogous to the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Thus, there's a, a kind of completeness to the writer's description of God's sovereignty and then a completeness of the praise which we are called to raise up. If you were with us last time, you might take a moment and look at Psalm 32 in the last line of Psalm 32. Because Psalm 33 picks up where Psalm 32 ends. It's a call for the upright to rejoice and shout for joy to the Lord. Taken with the fact that, that Psalm 33 has no superscription or title to speak of, commentators have conjectured about the connection between the two psalms. Should we read this as a continuation of thought between Psalm 32 in, in Psalm 33? Or, or were these two psalms arranged together uh, after the fact because there was this, this kind of uh, you know tie between one verse and the next? There are compelling reasons for both possibilities. Certainly, the theme of joy from Psalm 32 is present in chapter 33. And the personal nature of that happiness as it relates to the forgiveness of God is expanded to a global and historical scale in chapter 33. That said, a common authorship is hard to establish with any certainty. But the two chapters are together in the psalm book. And, and, and so there was a reason that these two, two uh, chapters were put together. It's interesting that when you, when you read the entirety of the Psalms as a songbook, and we've explored even some unknown musical or litur- liturgical terms which are present in the superscriptions of the titles, Psalm 33 is the first psalm to mention musical instruments in the text of the poem. The musical instruments in these opening verses are the lyre, which is a small harp-like instrument. And then there was a larger uh, harp, which was the harp of ten strings. The people are called to, to use that with great skill and, and accompany the choir of worshipers who, who then sing with an abandon that is intimated in the previous chapter. You'll remember in chapter 32, that word rejoice at the end of the chapter connoted a spinning or a dancing in praise before God. The indication is not about limiting uh, of the musical instruments or the, the, the musical stylings. These musical instruments and the shouts and the songs of praise, they point to the full array of musical worship available to God's people. The understanding is that the worship is supposed to be profound and God directed. It is a a new song, something that the Psalms uh, express over and over and over again, and it and it underscores the the ever new understandings that the people have about God, who he is and what he's done. In the New Testament era, that new song expression is representative of an eschatological reality, like Revelation chapter 5 verse 9, where it talks about the new song. In verses 1 through 3, there's kind of a a mini-inclusio. 
The command to shout for joy in verse 1 is balanced with the final line calling for loud shouts from the people. The center of this section is in verse 2's command to give thanks to the Lord. The content of any praise and worship, it's really about gratitude in one way or another. When we sing praises that seem to be pro- proclamations about who God is, when we, when we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, there is an implicit gratitude behind that proclamation because the presence of a holy God kind of excludes unholy people. But God invites us in, and there's a thanksgiving to be invited into the presence of a holy God. There's a a thanksgiving for the grace that would allow such a situation. The psalmist is aware of that reality, and so everything that is sung or prayed or shouted about should be done in an effort to express thanks and gratitude to the Lord. But what specifically are we to praise God for? Verses 4 and 5 give us a motivation for that worship. You know, God is not one who demands worship without demonstrating first his worth. You know, of course, God is worthy apart from any activity. If God did nothing for us, he would still be worthy of our praise. But he has chosen in his grace and mercy to act in the world. And he continues to act in the world. And it's upon this basis that this chapter's author calls the people to praise. The images that prevail in verses 4 and 5 are the images of word and work and love of the Lord. In very general terms, the psalmist talks about the appropriateness of the word of God. It is upright. That word, the word upright, is used of the worshiper in verse 1 and also in chapter 32 verse 11. The connection between those who are upright with the uprightness of the Word of God, it's obvious. The upright worshiper understands the upright Word of God. And that upright Word leads naturally to God's work in the world. In God's activity, He loves righteousness. He loves justice. When God moves in history, righteousness and justice prevail. And the relationship that God has with his unique people as exhibited by his steadfast love, that fills the earth. This hesed, which we've mentioned numerous times already, it's the special covenant love of God that God has for his people. This verse doesn't indicate that all people of the earth experience that love in the same covenant way that God's chosen people do. But the impact of that love will fill the earth. And this love is the constant upon which God's love for all the earth is expressed. It was not enough for the author just to make these general expressions in verse 4 and 5. Because in verses 6 through 17, he expounds on what that all means. There are two key areas that we're going to focus on. God's work in creation and God's work in history and human activity. You know, verse 6 and 7 tie to the preceding section by painting the picture of what God's upright word has done. It's by his word that he created. The allusion to Genesis 1 is obvious, as is the, Mo- as the Mosaic witness is keen to demonstrate that the creation of the earth and all the cosmos, the planets, and everything, it was not the result of some battle between, between gods or as a byproduct of, of pagan deities and their procreation or any other prevailing ancient Near Eastern myth. No, Moses describes creation in terms of God speaking. God spoke the world into existence. He spoke the universe into existence. God, by his word, he now continues to sustain the earth by by storing up such things as water, which are necessary for life. But when unleashed in torrents can be destructive. God, the psalmist expresses, hold all holds all this in his control by his upright word. And at the center of creation is humanity. And while all the earth are are, are supposed to fear the Lord in in, in an understandable submission to their creator, the inhabitants of the world are meant to look at the Lord in awe and wonder because of God's spoken resolute commands. Those resolute commands always come to pass. By contrast, in verse 10, the writer looks at the pointlessness of the plans or the counsels, the commands of the nations. 
And then he doubles down on that contrast in verse 11 by saying the Lord's counsel, that that means his plans which have yet to be fulfilled, they will stand. They, They will stand forever. And even the deepest plans of God's heart are felt amongst all generations. The nations whom the Lord has chosen, they're blessed. They're the happy ones because their plans are aligned with the plans of God. And so they gain a heritage on this earth. The reference to the promised land, the inheritance that God gave his chosen people is kind of obvious. God rescued them. He rescued his people from a very mighty nation, the nation of uh, of Egypt. And they were supposed to be the most powerful nation in the world. But God delivered these former slaves and then delivered them into the promised land, defeating the Canaanites, people who were far more capable warriors than they were. See, the the plans of the Egyptians, the plans of the Canaanites, they came to nothing. It was the plans of God which prevailed. And the nation, the nation of Israel, which was aligned with God's plan, they prevailed too. In the next movement of this section, uh, the Lord is presented as an observant king. In verses 13 through 15, there are these very uh, transcendent images. God looks down meaning that at least from a superlative standpoint, we we should think of him as, as being above. He sits enthroned as king, and yet he is observant of all creation. He's observant in a very general or universal way, but also in a very intimate and particular way. As verse 15 demonstrates, he sees all the deeds, all the actions of every inhabitant, every individual on earth. But because he's the maker of the heart, he also knows the thoughts and the minds and the motivations of all the inhabitants. It's not only what is observable to the human eye, which is available to the Lord, but literally even that which is otherwise invisible, that which we hold deepest in our hearts, God sees that. He knows that. This paints a picture of a God who's not only over all of creation, but present with and accessible to creation. In the ancient Near Eastern context, this was kind of unheard of. Gods might be thought of as as over all, but in a very human way, they kind of had a locality. They could, in some cases, be tricked because they didn't see everything. The Lord of the Hebrews is no such God. The contrast between our God and human authority is taken up again in verse 16 through and 17. It was the plans of the nations which came to nothing, while all of God's commands and decrees came to pass in verses 10 and 11. Now, in verses 16 and 17, it's the security of those human authorities that's called into question. The kings mentioned here represent human power. The armies, the horses, the warriors, they represent the means to enforce and hold that power. But, you know, we would be remiss if there was also not kind of a polemic against the view that human kings were themselves considered divine. Quite often, ancient Near Eastern monarchs were prayed to. They were worshipped as gods. You look at Daniel chapter 6 and, and King Darius, for example. They were, were commanded to worship and bow down to King Darius. But these verses highlight that such a notion is laughable. To to heighten this point, the author uses the term great three times in verses 16 and 17. It's almost sarcastic. By all appearances, these kings and armies, they, they seem great, but there's no salvation in them. There's no hope for true rescue. As McCann describes it, these kings are in search of a prolonged life and power in this life. But all of that, that's a gift from God cannot be achieved by human effort. Yet, just as the heavenly Lord and creator sees all the ultimately doomed plans of the nations, those nations who do not call upon him, and just as he observes the futile efforts of human leaders to save themselves and their followers, there's still hope. In verse 18, the Lord sees those who give him reverence and awe, those whose hope is based on his covenant love. That hope leads to the rescue that the war horses cannot deliver. It leads to the life that human armies cannot secure. The callback to verse 12, 
the happiness of the nations whom God has chosen, breaks in for an invitation to respond with a patient trust in the Lord, a trust in His name. That name is indicative of God's very character and the way that that character has been revealed in His activities amongst God's people. In the close, the writer makes one request in this psalm. He requests that the steadfast love, the covenant faithfulness of God would be upon all of God's people as they hope in Him. You know, there's a a, a privilege, as Craigie puts it, in this covenant relationship. And the writer wants to feel and experience that privilege. These closing lines are a reminder to the people of God that even when all the circumstances around us are presented as evidence to the contrary, we have a reason to be glad. We have a reason to celebrate because this great creator Lord is sovereign and he's on our side. You know, that hope and gladness reminds us again of the opening of this psalm. It's a call to worship and praise God. The writer, uh, the, the Apostle Paul, writes of God's amazing work in redemptive history through the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. He demonstrates that from the beginning of all creation and, and through the special relationship he has with Israel, God is present with people. And yet, humanity consistently turns from God. We sin. And we're spiritually unfaithful. And it's so persistent that in that same historical and creative space, God had to set the stage for the coming of his son, Jesus, so that once and for all, evil, sin, shame, death could be purged from the cosmos. There had to be a redemption. Paul talks about all this activity. And then in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he turns the corner. When he writes, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Psalm 33 prompts people to praise the Lord for his creative work and his activity. Paul uses all that God has done as the motivating factor behind his appeal to worship in a way that's not limited to simply musical expressions, but encompasses the entire life of a believer. For those who know Jesus as Savior and Lord, those who who trust in him, that trust goes beyond religiosity, but in a holistic way, there's a hope for salvation that doesn't take armies or tanks or guns or war horses to accomplish. The plans of the Lord for forgiveness and salvation, they're found on the path of service and sacrifice. When we really meditate on that, when we really consider that, what else can we do but offer our songs and a renewed life? every single day in praise to God. Will you join me in prayer? We thank you, God, that in in all of creation, in all of human history, you have demonstrated yourself to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. That we have an opportunity to hope in you. And so, God, I ask that you would renew in us a spirit of celebration for who you are and what you've done. And that all of our lives, that would be so easily seen. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, thanks everybody. And this week, there will be no Zoom discussion on Psalm 33, but we're going to pick up next week on Sunday with Psalm 34. I hope you'll join us. We'll see you next time.